Hello and welcome to theCUBE's exclusive coverage of AWS reInvent as part of our SuperCloud 5 special edition broadcast out of the Palo Alto studios. We're here on location, 11th year of theCUBE. We're going to be here for Monday through Thursday, wall-to-wall -wall coverage. We're going to have a ton of content. Of course, we've got a special report on SiliconANGLE. Check it out. Our next guest is Prasad Kalyanaram, who's the Vice President of Infrastructure Services at AWS. Welcome to theCUBE. Thanks for coming Thank on. you very much, John. It's a pleasure of meeting you. So we are getting set up. We were in the press area here. A lot of action. You know, a lot of briefings. Um, the keynotes tomorrow, we're, this is day one, so there's a lot of news we don't know about. I know about a little yeah. bit of it, you know all of it. Um, infrastructure. Well, there's one keynote today evening and the one tomorrow, <laughs> so we'll, we'll stay Peter tuned. DeSanto, so it's going to be a lot of infrastructure and yes. chips. Um, I wrote a post, I think exclusive with Adam Selesky, he kind of laid it out. He didn't reveal it, but it was pretty much a preview of what's to come. The business of ADF is strong, uh, you know, although most people don't understand how that business works. It's very lumpy, you do a lot of upfront discounts, but overall, net new business is growing fast. Um, cost optimization is almost done, but there's a surge of generative AI spending that's coming because we're in an experimental phase. This is the hottest conversation here at reInvent is the generative AI services that are coming. And at the three layer stack, the infrastructure piece, huge enabler for you guys. The model layer, foundation model layer is where the, where the action is, that's the new middleware, mm -hmm. right? That's the, what's going on, a lot of activity yeah. there. You got Anthropic, you got Bedrock, um, you can SageMaker. Hugging face and so on. Everything's yeah. in there, but the, it's the infrastructure is going to be key. There's a huge you know, conundrum around GPUs. People just get their hands on them. They're sold out. There's supply chain problems. You guys have a differentiation with the chips coming and the relationship with, say, Anthropics highlights where this is going. So um, share, your, share the vision of what you're working on right now because the infrastructure layer, just like I'd say Cloud 1.0, was a huge enabler for developers, startups, and companies to get value quickly. Yeah, well, uh, John, uh, um, you talked about generative AI, and in fact, I often want to talk about how many things have not changed <laughs> uh, in the infrastructure layer, and it's important to really take stock of it, and the reason why it's important is because this is not something you can just enable overnight. This is over years of innovation that we've actually done, and I'll talk about a few things here. Uh, the most obvious one is like in terms of our chip design and in terms of our investments. And if you think about, uh, we've been working all the way from Graviton to Inferentia to Tranium. Um, and over the course of time, we keep innovating on the chip design and we keep mm -hmm. innovating on uh, price performance of these chips as well. Uh, but then there's a lot of other things in the infrastructure that's important. I'll start off with security, right? Uh, security is job number one, and that remains true uh, in the generative AI space as well. And if you think about our innovations on Nitro, our innovations on making sure that we have secure communications between our data centers uh, and we encrypt the traffic, all that is actually fundamental to generative AI. Um, it's also important that customers' data are secure. So that's on the security angle. And the next part of it is our networking angle, which is how do we innovate on the networking side. Um, as these models become larger in size, it's important for inter-process communication and inter-node yeah. uh, inter communication. And that's where in 2018 we launched EFA, Elastic Fabric Adapter. And lately, uh, you'll ta we'll talk about it uh, in, in, through the course of this week on what we call as network innovations that we've done in the form of ultra clusters, which allows us to increase the bandwidth between these different nodes on the network, as well as the latency reduction that these, uh, these large language models need. And the last part of it is in our supply chain innovation, right? Like, yeah. we, as you all probably know, that uh, we build our own servers, we design our own servers as well, and we've gone down to the details of trying to make sure that, that, that the hardware infrastructure is fairly efficient from a power and from a system sustainability perspective. Adam Slesky always talks about it. We love the word and at, a, at Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> we have customers and we have partners with Nvidia and others. So I want to get your reaction to a, a quote uh, just published yesterday, my exclusive with Adam Slesky. Um, the, set, the premise was the real challenge in Generative AI is integrating the chips with critical infrastructures like networking storage and scalable clusters. The integration is vital for the future of Generative AI as workloads grow in diversity and complexity. That was my prompt to Adam. His quote, I want to get your reaction to, he says, the customers recognize it's not about just having chips, but also having highly performed servers around the chips, such as networking inside the clusters. Quote, we've seen customers go and investigate their own GPU clusters, I put that in there, uh, and then come running back to us saying, you know, having chips is great, but it doesn't actually work. <laughs> what, what scenarios, because a lot of people right now are trying to think, oh, I'll just get some GPUs, I'll put them on premise, and I'm good to go. 
you now have a similar paradigm as the old cloud days where it's like, hey, I can do some stuff on premises in the data center, but that's not the same data center. What it's is not. This is a huge a nuanced point, but for people considering standing up their own infrastructure to support their workloads, what's so complex about them? What's different about the AI workloads that the yeah. infrastructure is better in the cloud? Yeah, well, the first thing is that if you think about it, for you to even run any kind of generative AI workloads, whether it's training or inference and so on, you need a corpus of data services, right? And so it's not just about putting the chips in there, even if you figured out a way of connecting them, uh, it's also important to actually figure out where your data is going to be stored and you need a really highly scalable data source, which is yeah. performant. And so, you look at services like S3, and you look at zero EBS, ETL. and so on, zero ETL, and yeah. so on. So you need the data layer that comes with it, right? Yeah. Now beyond the data layer, if you're running it just for your own application, you can probably put a certain level of perimeter security on top of it, but you need security at every layer of the infrastructure stack. All the way from the, from the Nitro layer, where we actually build it on the servers, to the network layer, and then to the perimeter as well. So that's the second part. So you need the data services to provide you the data, then you need the network. Now the network itself, if you were connecting a few machines together, a few hundred machines, you can do that with a fairly flat network, right? And there are traditional network topologies that are out there, like the Clo fabric is a very common fabric that many customers and many other providers use as well. But what we had to do was that that fabric is not sufficient for the low latency that you need. And so we had to go and innovate on ultra clusters to try and reduce that, that network latency. And we've been building our own yeah. uh, set of, of network devices and our own operating systems also on this network. And so because of that, we could actually change all of that through control planes in our software to actually optimize our network to be able to be performant for generative AI. So you can do these at small scale, when you actually have to yeah. do this at a larger scale and when you have to build an end-to-end -end application like that, you need the data services, you need the network, you need the security, you need the supply chain. You know, when, I remember when you guys came out with Nitro and Hypervisor, Dave Vellante and I were like, oh my God, this is ice. we can see where this is going. Of course, we had interviews with James Hamilton, you kind of lay the dots out to connect, but now you're in multiple generations of chips. Okay, yeah. you mentioned some of those advancements with what you guys are building. As you look at this next wave of, of training, which I see as more of a setup, like a sandbox of data. Mm -hmm. Training will still be around, but right now yeah. all that's, everyone's talking about training costs. Okay, that's pretty big to train, but the inference is where the action is. Yeah, right. Okay, Adam confirmed that on my post there, uh, as well in person. We've been seeing it in the industry. Inference is where the ongoing iteration is with the data. Right. What needs to be in place to make that inference work at scale? Because inference is going to be everywhere. Right. Edge, core, premise, everywhere. That's right, and, and this is where the statement that it is not just about the chips is so critical, right? Because when you actually have an, an application, I know John, you and I were talking about an application for, that you all built, yeah. it was a pretty cool application on, <laughs> on, on Cube. You liked that, didn't you? Yes, I did, <laughs> uh, on, on your uh, video application. If you think about it, all the other data that's yeah. there, all the other services that are required to make that happen, um, it's hard to do that if you just had chips. You need the other underlying services, right? And that's where if you think about all the services, the 240 plus services that we built over yeah. many years, uh, and the 3,300 plus yeah. features that you get every year, um, those are critical to actually really build an application. So I believe in the fullness of time, and uh, there will still be foundational models. People will build smarter and smarter foundational models. They'll be larger, some will be more specific as well. But then you need to actually have inference to build applications, and for you, for you to be able to do that, you need all the other AWS services that are there. You need the infrastructure to be there. You need the high levels of availability. And, and don't forget power that's actually important, right? You need to pre produce sustainable power. And as you know, like we're very committed to actually being 100% renewable by 2025. We're 90% there, and yeah. we expect to actually get there as well. Actually, I'll be interviewing former Amazonian uh, Adrian Cockroft later this week. He's yeah. been doing a big thing on sustainability. The energy required is huge. Give yeah. some insight into um, the costs and complexity of the the energy involved in these new generative AI apps are pretty much off the charts from, 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 a, yeah. from, a, from a, give a, give a, scope it out for us. For yeah, magnitude. so let me take, give you a, a little bit of an idea of what a chip actually really takes in terms of power. Typically the current generation chips are about 700 to 800 kilowatts a chip. Um, uh, you're going to actually reach, uh, um, sorry, eight, 700 to 800 watts. You're going to reach 1.1 1 .1, and at that point is when you're going to have to require liquid cooling on these chips, right? And so compared to a traditional compute server, 
Um, typically, some of these ML servers, whether it's Trainium or whether it's, uh, it's GPUs, uh, they will consume about, uh, about 2x or so the power. Um, and so, on a particular server, the number of servers you can stack in a rack is very limited. Uh, um, an AWS rack typically has about 20 to 30 servers, that's common in the industry. Whereas an ML server is going to have about two to three, not more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you need to actually be able to cool the server as well. And today, um, we've been actually fairly efficient in being able to liquid, to air cool these servers. But that's that was something that we've been working on. We've been working on this in the lab environment for many years now, because we knew that this day was going to come in terms of liquid cooling, and that's something that we had actually yeah. uh, innovated on as well. Yeah, I, I got to give you guys props. You see in the, the skate where the puck is, as the saying goes, mm -hmm. uh, you guys have done that. The question I want to ask you is, what's different about the generative AI workloads? Again, because you guys talk about there's three layers of the stack, but you have the traditional, I would say traditional yeah. cloud services. Never thought I'd call AWS traditional services, but you know, the standard stuff before, the non-gen AI workloads still require storage networking. What's going to be the infrastructure requirements for to power the Gen AI work? Yeah, a few things that will be different. Uh, as I said, lots will be similar, but there'll be a couple of things that'll be different. Uh, one is that like the server design requires us to be careful about how many servers we can pack in a particular rack, because typically on a particular rack, you have a certain whip that comes into the server, and so you have a certain amount of power that you can deliver, right? And so, um, that's one part of the infrastructure that has to be different because the servers actually consume more power. The second thing is that you have to be careful about how you land these servers on a particular lineup. And the reason for that is that um, you want to probably maximize the usage of utility power and any power that actually comes into a particular lineup, right? You don't want to leave any stranded power. Power is so expensive in a data center that you want to actually maximize the use of it. And so how you land these servers and what kind of servers you land on a particular lineup requires a certain amount of optimization that you need to do. Mm -hmm. And we have systems that decide what servers need to land on, land on every single lineup, how do we maximize the use of, or use of power. Think of it as a bin packing problem, but you have to actually bin pack knowing that a few future supply chains, you don't have perfect mm -hmm. visibility into it, so you have to actually use some predictive capabilities on what you need to land on a particular lineup. That's on the power side of it. Uh, we already talked a little bit about the network and how the network has to be low latency and that we've been building it over a period of time as well. And then the, the third part of it is uh, just all the other supply chain components to make the server actually come to fruition, right? Yeah. Uh, you could build like servers by just taking stock servers that are commercially available. That won't be highly efficient over a long period of time. Yeah. And so we innovate fairly deep into the supply yeah. chain in terms of building our own manufacturing capabilities and try and optimize the supply chain for an entire server as well. That's also going to be different. You guys certainly are going to have a great advantage. I got to ask you the question around, um, as these new paradigms that come, come, there's always change. Um, both Adam and Matt Garman both told me on, on camera that they recognize that there's going to be some use cases where you're going to want to have data on, on location or at the edge, obviously, uh, you can't get to it. Um, so, the, so how should companies think about their on-premises cloud operations uh, from a design standpoint? Because the, with the LLMs and the models coming out, there's proprietary data that's going to be their that's crown right. jewel. Yeah. And that's be becoming well understood. Like, wait a minute, I'm not going to throw everything into an open or closed large model like uh, OpenAI or Anthropic. I want to keep this protected. Mm -hmm. So I'll maybe keep it on premise for compliance reasons, or I put it in the cloud, you guys have VPCs and all that. Don't, no need to go into that. But like, for the designers out there thinking, oh, I'll just stand up my own infrastructure and then I'll connect to the cloud via an API. What's your recommendation of how to craft that data center strategy yeah. uh, or well, on-premises strategy? Uh, if, if you think about it, uh, this is where I think our years of innovation actually pays for itself. Um, uh, we started off with our AWS regions and then we built a fairly large edge network with a fairly redundant backbone as well. Our backbone is all 100 gig and it's our own custom backbone that we actually built. It's not one of those networks that was just lying around and then we happened to use it for the cloud. <laughs> we had to build it from scratch, right? And we manage all the routing on that layer as well, right? So you have our AWS regions where like 99 plus percent of our uh, workloads are going to run. As you said, there will be some use cases where customers might require on-prem locations uh, for sensitive data, um, although the cloud is becoming a lot more secure today than, <laughs> than it was ever before. Yeah. Um, and, and so our innovation on outposts are going to be super critical for those set of customers, right? Uh, beyond that, in the middle, we also have local zones for latency-sensitive workloads. So if you think about the layers of our mm -hmm. infrastructure, you have our AWS regions where we expect large majority of our workloads to run. We have local zones where we will have latency 
latency sensitive workloads will run. You have outposts where you will actually have some, um, some, of, the, some of the workloads that customers want to keep on-prem run. Um, and then uh, recently we announced uh, with the Singapore government the dedicated local zones. So some of the more sensitive workloads like the government workloads mm -hmm. may require their own local zones as well and we've been able to build that for them as well, right? And so that entire stack, all the way from our regions to local zones to dedicated local zones to outposts, pretty much covers the gamut of all workloads that customers may want to run. So Inferentia, uh, Graviton, Tranium, big chips, local zone, you got FSX in there. What, what's the chip scene going to be like for the folks coming out of reInvent? What's going to be the, what's going to be the big takeaway from an infrastructure standpoint? Well, uh, the thing is that uh, when we get into these things, we get into these things for the long term, right? So if you think about Graviton, we started off with the first version of Graviton, we didn't release Graviton 2, Graviton 3, and every single version of it is, yeah. like Graviton 3 is 25% more efficient than Graviton 2. And we expect that yeah. customers will keep pushing us on price performance and we're very happy to actually innovate on that. You'll see the same things on our Inferentia as well as our Tranium chips as well. we'll see, you'll see continuous innovation. Stay tuned for a yeah. bunch of announcements yeah. today. And again, we're going to have announcements on all layers of the stack, yeah. all the way from the infrastructure layer, to the model layer, to the application layer. It's funny how um, I asked Adam about the competition. He said, not everyone is innovating at all three layers. Uh, Microsoft announced uh, a chip set, but it's only for internal use. That's Apparently right. really not ready for prime time. Um, you guys are on third generation, big advantage. Um, and then integrating into the models is very interesting as you learn about what those workloads are going to be like. I'm sure there's going to be more chips. Yeah. Uh, as a VP of infrastructure services, how does that impact your job um, every day? Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, busy. <laughs> um, well, the thing is that uh, it is, we're, we're in an era right now where I think we're actually seeing the next clip of cloud growth. Yeah. And some of the challenges that we're going to be facing and our customers are going to push us on, it's going to be super exciting. You just think about yeah. every layer of the stack, all the way from, you know, I talked about networking, I talked about supply chain systems, I talked about, like innovation in supply yeah. chain is unheard of before to it, right? Yeah. What is a cloud provider to do with supply chains? Like yeah. all the automation systems that we are actually building in terms of how we land racks, how we actually yeah. design lineups. Our data center design is going through a bunch of innovation. We've been on that journey for a long time. Um, sustainability is such a core area for us, right? Yeah. Just look at the 400 plus yeah. projects that we've actually enabled. Uh, we're the largest procurer of, of renewable power in the world today. <laughs> uh, and that, that doesn't come, like yeah. it, no one would actually imagine that a cloud provider would actually become the largest procurer of renewable energy. Yeah. And here we are. And so, uh, you know, not a day goes by where I don't think about all these things, and, I, and as you rightly pointed out, yeah. for us it's an and, it's not an or. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah Prasad, it's been great. Great to have you on, and great to have a conversation. You know, three Thank years you. ago, Dave and I were on theCUBE, and everyone's like, we don't want to talk about speeds and feeds, let's talk about solutions and value to the customer. Past year, two years ago, we said hardware matters, and we're like, people are booing us, well, what do you mean hardware matters? I'm like, no, the world's going to come back to speeds and feeds. Yes. And I think at the end of the day, your customers, all the hype aside, when it comes down to cost, Energy, cost, and then also time to value. Price, and performance, price and capabilities, yeah. right? Yeah. And security, <laughs> security has to remain number one. Yeah. So. Yeah. And data too, like all, it's all kind of coming together. A whole new operating system is coming. Uh, congratulations, thanks for coming. Thank, Thank you very much, John. It. Price. Okay, Great. Cube coverage here on location from SuperCloud 5, part of reInvent's coverage of our coverage at theCUBE in Silicon Valley. I'm John Furrier, we'll be back with more after this short break. <laughs>